Paul, thank you so much. And I love not going first because while I was sitting there listening to you, I can think about all the things you're saying and how that applies to what's happened to me over the last 17 years, I think, was when I found a good energy. Um, I'm going to start with somebody else's quote because actually it kind of sums up what I feel about what I do, essentially. So for me, um, a lot of the problems we're facing, whether it's climate change, water scarcity, energy shortages, good health, they all interlink. They come back to a similar place. But before I go on, I want to take you to a place where I started. So um, I grew up in the 80s, pretty much. I think that's pretty, probably my formative years. Um, I was a high-carbon kid. I had uh, back-combed hair. I learned how to drive when I was 17, got my freedom. Uh, my dad was a rallying co-driver. My mum did some rallying co-driving as well. And that was the world I knew. I didn't think any different. I didn't think there was a different way of doing things. That's what I saw when I grew up. And I was really lucky because I went um, and I studied physics. Um, and I got to study something called atmospheric physics, which started to look at um, essentially what our planet was and how our atmosphere worked. And it was during that time, um, it was a similar time to, uh, there was a big storm in the southwest, 1987, people might remember, um, and there was a very famous weatherman who went on TV with his big, big jumpers called Mr. Fish. And uh, Mr. Fish said uh, that there's a bit of a storm coming through, but it's going to miss us. And there was this woman who came on the phone, lying TV, and said, we've got a hurricane. And he said, well, you can't have a hurricane because they're not allowed to be called that here in the UK. I was like, yeah, well technicalities. Um, but in fact, she was right and he was wrong. And part of um, what we were studying kind of explained that, explained that um, the ship was off course, that they took a temperature on, they put it through a climate model, and they thought it missed the UK, and it didn't. And it was at that point you started to see the sensitivity of our climate, the sensitivity of the way we look at weather, and what massive impacts it can have on us. And if you then follow that thread, and that's what I did, if you then go, okay, so if if our climate, if our atmosphere is so sensitive to change, what, what is changing it at the moment? What's making it change? And you, you follow that thread, and the first place you hit is energy, our use of energy. And you think of our society. For me, when I look at it, um, I have a daughter, and we read Harry Potter a lot. And Harry Potter talks about magic. And for me, our magic in our society is actually energy. Energy has allowed us to do so many things. Think if you woke up every day in your life and didn't have energy, electricity that you could switch on, or heat in your homes that you can cook, uh, that you can cook with as well. Think about that. And that, that, for our society, is our magic. Yet that magic, potentially, is changing the whole way we live on this planet. It's going to change what we do. And so I went on that little trail, and I got to energy. I thought, OK, I don't know that much about the energy market. Um, I need to try and figure out. And, and, and in the late 80s, if you try to apply for a job related to climate change, they didn't exist. There wasn't, there wasn't something I can go, yeah, I'll go to be, you could be an accountant, you could be a lawyer, you could be all the classic things our society has created for jobs for graduates. But you couldn't go into fill in climate change activist. It didn't really exist. So I went off to Europe, and I spent a year in Europe. Um, looking at energy systems. And energy systems are fascinating. If you ever get, them, take, if you ever get a chance, and it's probably quite dull, but um, take a look at where all the energy systems are in Europe. Take a look at the gas and oil pipelines and where they come from and where they go to. Um, and I always used to think, so if you look at the gas pipelines and the directional flows of the gas pipelines, you can look it up online on Eurostat. <laughs> Has anybody, does, does everybody remember the old dad's army? And the opening scene with the arrows coming into the UK, well, that's what it looks like. And, it, and, and for me, it's quite interesting because energy is so fundamental to our security as well as where we buy our energy from, where we take the money that we've got in this country, that we create in our economy, we spend it. That we then, we, and we have to think about where we spend it because it then supports an economy that we may, from a, from a liberal point of view, may not agree with. And so it's, it's quite interesting when you begin to see an energy economy, what it looks like. It's got this massive infrastructure. It's got this rent that you basically can concentrate wealth. It's very difficult to set up an oil pipeline if you haven't got a huge amount of money. And then you can take a rent from that oil pipeline. Nobody else can access your market. It's essentially a monopoly. And it's very similar to the power station systems that were set up. If you look at a picture of France, and I love this. If you put a look at a picture of France, France's got 
the biggest nuclear load in Europe. They put all their power stations on their borders, so if there was a nuclear incident, it wouldn't hit Paris. You can imagine how well that went down with their neighbours. So I think Luxembourg has always refused to buy its power from France, just out of protest, because I think the nuclear fallout would be bigger than the country. So in these situations, this is once you start to kind of go down the street and you go, wow, look at this system we've created. I mean, it's pretty amazing, but it's actually creating, making us go in a particular direction. And if you want to start to change that system and go in a low-carbon system, it's quite hard. So I spent some time working um, in Brussels on legislation, trying to put through carbon taxes, possibly the most frustrating six months of my life when you go, this is, of course, this makes sense. Economically, it makes sense. Um, but there was just no way. You had to do a deal with the Italians on their milk quotas, and then you had to do a deal somewhere else. So it just didn't happen. And I came back to the UK, and as well, Brussels was kind of a bit depressing. The UK was even worse. Um, I went to a debate on future energy technologies at the House of Commons. And um, at the time, I can't remember who actually was in power, actually. But there, were, there, was a, there was a committee meeting, and on one side were the Conservatives and the other side were the Labour. And they descended into this nightmare argument about nuclear versus coal. Um, and there was this massive folder which was talking about energy efficiency, CHP, all these other different wonderful technologies. And they didn't get anywhere near talking about them. They didn't even look at the folder. And I just thought, oh, this is so frustrating. So how do you go from bypassing a government who's just not listening to you? And you can see what's happening. And that was the foundation of good energy. There's some other steps in there, but the foundation was actually, let's go to people. People get this, and people do get it. If you go and talk to people, people get this. So that's one of the reasons I set up good energy. And really what it was there to do, so what I saw good energy always as was a practical way of really understanding what you needed to do to transfer this market into this market. Because it is a fundamentally different marketplace, and it comes back to Paul's point, is that renewables have zero, zero cost in production. So they completely destroy the energy market, and, and it's actually what's interesting happening at the moment. And these guys are desperately trying to hold on by creating a bunch of market mechanisms to create it. But essentially, these power stations, we have a very, very, we have what's called the Rolls-Royce grid, um, large grid from north to south and across, lots of um, wires. And classically, we just plugged in big power stations, big levers, a national grid. Basically, the way those guys worked is they used to ring up on a Monday morning. Um, it, it was called Monday morning itis because the guys who ran the power stations would always be a bit sleepy on a Monday morning. And they'd have to ring them up, wake them up, and get them to turn the power stations on. And that was how they ran the grid. So in the last four years, what's happened is 13 gigawatts, so that's kind of four times the size of Hinkley in terms of capacity of solar has gone onto the network, and they didn't know about it. Kind of, it was like a revolution in the solar market. It kind of came by surprise. And suddenly these guys are actually having to work, and they don't understand. It's like, we've got to forecast this, and we've got to do a bunch of different things. And you can see this massive resistance between this. So the reason I set up Good Energy was to try and be an interface, to try and find ways to unlock this marketplace, to allow us to go from here to here. Um, and, it, and, and it's always been a purpose. We did a lot of work at the beginning of the organization. And I have to say, we haven't changed it. We probably could do some work on it, because it's quite a mouthful. But essentially, what we're looking to do is climate change is about habitability of this planet. It's about allowing us to continue to live here. Because if, we, if, we, if climate change really kicks in, there are parts of this planet that will be uninhabitable. You'll get mass migration, and the pressures that we're already seeing in terms of uh, people moving around will just increase. And, and I think that's another pressure on the right wing that we're seeing already coming through. So part of the model has always been, one, to create a world where consumers can become part of the solution, not part of the problem. Two, that actually we can use some of the money that's sloshing around to the capital markets to try and um, deliver that. And three, we can actually influence government with proper solutions. So we know what we're doing. We're not just a consultancy or an NGO coming up with the concept. We know what the nuts and bolts are, and that if you turn that cog here, you're going to have this effect here. And that was really what we've always done. And so as an organization, we are active in all those areas. Um, and what do we do? We... We trade with over 1,000 generators in the UK, from farmers through to local communities. 
Um, we have a call centre with highly trained staff who can answer questions about your solar panels through to your bill. Um, we invest, we actually build renewable generation as well. And one of the reasons we started doing that is because the banking system was such that if, you don't, if you're not one of the big six, they didn't like you. So we thought, okay, well, we're going to have to get into the system and start changing that because we need to have face-to-face, -face. one removed, we can't influence it. And finally, we, we're one of the biggest organisations who look after people who generate power in their own homes. And for me, this is almost the ultimate. We started doing this a long time ago, and it's the real change. It's the democratisation of energy. It's the taking the power away from the big monopolies. So where do we come from? One of the things I started up with is I didn't really want to spend my time trying to lobby government. We do lobby, lobby government, but we don't just do it as an NGO, as an organisation. We wanted to spend more time with these people, with customers, with people who are actually going, I want to do this, how do I do this? Um, and actually get some ideas from them. And what we found is that stood us in incredibly good stead. Um, one of the things I am disappointed about is I don't sit next to the call centre anymore. Because listening to what people say is much more powerful than asking them a question. Hearing the general converse is where, for me, where all the best ideas in the organisation have come from. Um, and making sure that we're actually at the cutting front, understanding why local communities don't want wind farms in their, in their backyards, understanding what you can do about that, understanding how you can unpick some of these things. Unless you do it, it's really difficult to advise on it. So, for me, it's all about the customer. We wanted to create a blueprint for the new low carbon economy. And it's difficult. It's not straightforward. You do have low marginal costs. Um, you do move to a service model rather than transporting power around the country. You start to change that. And we've always seen ourselves as a blueprint. And, and in some ways, it's quite heartening that um, companies like E.ON are beginning to restructure. So, E.ON, one of the biggest power generators in the UK, have begun to restructure to look more like us. They've got rid of all their coal assets and put it into a different business. And their consumer and renewables businesses are together. So it's quite interesting that I think we're beginning to see some of that. Um, at the beginning, we were very radical and entrepreneurial. Well, we were in relativity to the rest of the energy market. Um, my first conversation with the regulator was, um, they, I wanted a license to supply electricity. They said, that's fine. You need three years auditor accounts. Now, anybody who runs a business knows that you've got to be operating for three years. If you're an entrepreneur, you will be starting the month before. So we had this circular conversation. It, it's <coughs> one of those classic things. When you try and break a model, you find that every single step, it's really hard. Um, and and um, I'll skip over the next bit, but what was really interesting is when we tried to raise money, we had exactly the same piece. So if you're a tech entrepreneur and you wanted to go in with a this whizzy piece of software, the city loved you, despite the fact that we had that big boom and bust, despite the fact that none of these models ever worked. We went with a very practical model, and they said, maybe he's going to buy green. Um, and so actually what we did is, by sitting next to the call centre, I heard the customer say, well, we want to invest. We want to be part of who you are. And they did. And so our first fundraising, we did essentially a crowdfunding back in 2002. And those are the people who bought into the company and gave us the first, money, um, the first money that we needed as an organisation. And what was really interesting about that, they gave us the right amount of money as well. So if you go to the city, they want to give you loads of money because that means they can charge loads of um, fees for raising that money. When you go to your customer base, they're quite happy to give you a 1,000 quid, but you take it from a lot of different people. So it becomes a very different feeling to it. And in terms of talking to them, it becomes very different. So... And I've sort of touched on this innovation piece. Um, the home generation, the reason why we work with so many small generators, is that in about 2003, 2004, I was beginning to get calls from people saying that some of the big six had cut them off. And um, I was also trying to trade in a marketplace where nobody wanted to give me credit. So if you want to buy energy, you, have to, you, you either have to go and get a credit line from a bank or you have to have a credit rating. And actually, what was really interesting is these small generators, they were similar to me. They didn't need to buy, I didn't need credit from them, and they didn't need credit from me. So you ended up with this brilliant model where 
I've provided them a marketplace because they were being cut off because they were too small to bother with by the big guys. And they provided me with a way of get, buying power with no credit. And this became this virtuous circle has been the basis of the company for many years after that. Um, and I think what you see is that government followed that in about eight years later. They got there eventually. Um, tidal lagoons, one of the things that we invested in this year. Now, this is a big technology, but again, it's a technology, if you bring that together with micro-technologies and big technologies, you begin to break the models again. Now, what's fascinating about this technology is this technology is likely to last for about 120 years, which government cannot get its head around. It wants to get a return on it, or it wants to price it as if it's going to be a 30-year asset. But it's going to be here for years and years and years. And this, this is the other major issue, is that infrastructure investment needs government support. But government hates making that decision. And they really hate doing it with anything other than another government. So you, you get into this nightmare situation. Um, another area we're testing is local currency. How do you make sure that money stays in the local area? And that is really powerful as well. We've seen a lot of that. Um, and we've launched a community strategy this year, which is how do we get communities as well as individuals involved? And how do communities come around renewables? Now, I'm conscious I'm going to have to shift a bit because I'm going to run out of time. Um, one of the things as an organisation is we've grown a lot over the last couple of years. Um, and I have to say, I think we lost our way a little bit. We lost our way around innovation and we lost our way around some of our values. And it's taken, we've put a lot of effort in over the last year to regain those. Um, and it is it's quite interesting as an organisation, you, you, you kind of come into that, you've got a really clear vision of what you do. And then you get kind of flat out and you go and talk at a lot of conferences <laughs> and you forget to spend time in the business. And in fact, I've cut back on all my speaking except for events like this so that I can focus on the business. Because you do forget the message that you're giving externally, you need to give internally. And that's become really powerful. And in fact, we just did our engagement survey and it's up at about 84, 85%, which is pretty good. And 99% of the people who work in a company, 330 people, understand our mission and understand what they're trying to do in their job every day going towards that mission, which is incredibly powerful. Um, so I'm going to flick to what we're doing in terms of innovation net. So our big challenge now is to grow um, because what we want to do is prove this model is not just on the scale we are today, but at five times bigger as well. And one of the things we've worked with Open Utility, you're going to be, James is going to be talking later, um, but one of the key products that we just launched yesterday, which is about how you get businesses really thinking about where their energy comes from. For the first time in the UK, you have the power to select your power because we are changing the way your electricity is sourced. This is decentralised. This is local. 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 This is national. This is 100% renewable. Wind. Solar. Hydro. Zero carbon. Good energy. From across the UK. This is your choice. This is Selectricity. 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 Enabling you to deliver your corporate social responsibility goals and bring to life your organisation's commitment to zero carbon emissions. Together. 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 We are Good Energy Selectricity. Thank you. And um, thanks to my team who did an amazing job of trying to bring that to life in terms of what we do. So for me as an organisation, our challenge is going forward is how do we get that much bigger and start to make these business models work really on a national scale, while keeping to our values and while keeping to our early entrepreneurial vision. And that is really about focus. And, and for me, as a leader, what I've recognised is I need to come back to the business so much more. We are bucking a trend. We are trying to change this marketplace. And I have to get that balance between trying to go and influence government and influencing our own teams. 
And this product here is the first. I mean, what's interesting about this, this is, this is really about people deciding where they're going to buy their power from. But what happens is people start to think about what they're using their power for and how they're using it, and what time of day they're using it. And people start to change behavior. And that's massive, that bottom-up piece that has been so dismissed by this market for years and years and years. Um, and one of the things that really... At the company, we've, we've refound being friendly, collaborative, and innovative is really important to us. Listening and doing the right thing. These are our values at Good Energy, and these are the ones we want to stick to and have come back to. And I hope if you ever get hold of us or touch us, that we express those throughout everything. Thank you very much for listening.